playing double agent in one of the most ruthless drug trafficking areas in Mexico was a dangerous game. But that didn't stop Carlos Landin Martinez. The feared El Puma Uno was a man of many talents and loyalties. Known for his militant tactics as a Mexican police commander, it came as a complete surprise to many when it was revealed that his aggressive stance applied to both sides of the law. Born and raised in Reynosa, Tamaulipas, Mexico, Carlos Landin Martinez was an integral part of the Tamaulipas State Police, where he was a commander in the Homicide Investigatory Task Force. His colleagues nicknamed him El Puma Uno, which translates to Puma One, because he struck just as fiercely as a puma at criminals. His relentless pursuit of high-profile criminals gained him a reputation as a skilled policeman, and although some may not agree with his somewhat hostile methods, no one could deny the work that he put in. This would explain the utter shock that struck the police force when Carlos was arrested in March of 1997 for reportedly being involved with Los Nichos, a Reynosa drug gang. He, along with fellow police chief Pablo Villanueva Hernandez, were both arrested by the Attorney General's office. It only took a few hours for Carlos to be released from custody due to a lack of evidence, but that was more than enough time for suspicions to arise about where his loyalties truly lie. Even though he returned to his regular police duties, many of his colleagues started to see him differently. On May 28, 1999, former Tamaulipas Governor Tomas Yarrington ordered the permanent release of 10 police chiefs due to suspected associations with known drug trafficking rings. Carlos Landin Martinez was one of the ten laid off. It turns out that Carlos had been heavily involved with the Gulf Cartel, a criminal organization based in Tamaulipas, during his time on the force. He was using his occupation as a police officer to disguise his allegiances to the illegal drug trade. He acted as a double agent to avoid speculation and provide information to his cartel to keep them one step ahead of the curve. El Puma was undoubtedly a man on a mission, considering how hectic his schedule was. During the day, he would be on patrol searching for notorious criminals. At night, he would join the very criminals he was hunting for and check in with the international drug trafficking organization that he ran. When he wasn't doing either, he would spend time in the United States with his family, including his three children and four grandchildren. It was said that Carlos had close ties with the infamous Los Zetas, a ruthless enforcer group in the Gulf Cartel the same Los Zetas that would later make deadly waves within the organization by testing the loyalties of the cartel and attempting to start their own cartel in 2010. But that was after Carlos's time. The U.S. authorities were able to tie Carlos back to drug trafficking activities in 1998. They found evidence of a partnership between Martinez's criminal cells in Granjano and Penitas, Texas in a smuggling ring led by Francisco Meza Rojas, who also happened to be a former officer of the law. For years, Martinez's organization was responsible for some of the most large-scale drug smuggling operations from Mexico to the U.S. The Gulf Cartel utilized the Rio Grande River as a designated drop-off and pickup spot for their middlemen, who then arranged distribution to other smugglers in the McAllen area, to store the goods in various stores and stash houses throughout the city. At a pre-arranged time, the drugs were picked up and snuck across the border at patrol stations in Falfurias and Sarita. After the narcotics made it onto American soil, they would then be distributed to major cities like Tampa, Dallas, Nashville, Atlanta, and New York City. When the transactions were complete, the money would be brought back to Mexico through the Reynosa border, right into the waiting hands of El Puma himself. In January 2005, Martinez was appointed second-in-command of the Gulf Cartel in Reynosa, and that's when he truly started to gain influence and power as a notorious drug lord. He was in charge of supervising and monitoring a drug smuggling corridor that extended between Gustavo Diaz Ordaz and Rio Bravo in Tamaulipas. Martinez and his crew were responsible for collecting taxes from anyone external to the organization that wanted to use it. Those refusing to pay the tax or those who lost any product or money would suffer brutal consequences at Martinez's command. Whether kidnapping, torture, or cold-blooded murder, the outcome was never pretty for anyone who crossed El Puma. At the time, the corridor was a popular spot for smugglers and a moneymaker for the Gulf Cartel. Martinez worked directly under the kingpin Gregorio Sacida Gamboa, ensuring the corridor maintained its profitability. However, it wasn't long before Gregorio's reign over the corridor would end, and the power would pass down to Martinez. Gregorio had been suffering from a cancer diagnosis and a severe substance abuse problem causing his subordinates to question his leadership and whether or not he was suited to run the corridor. These changes in leadership caused a significant divide within the cartel, and internal conflict rose to new heights. Many disagreed with implementing different leadership, while others welcomed new rule with open arms. Needless to say, in an organization as lethal as the Gulf Cartel, violence ensued. Multiple high-ranking members of the cartel were found murdered, and in 2006, 
Carlos Landin Martinez was rumored to be dead. But Carlos wouldn't meet his demise from the barrel of a gun. It would be at the hands of the police. In the mid-2000s, Operation Puma was launched by the United States Drug Enforcement Administration in hopes of bringing down the Gulf Cartel's extensive smuggling network. Their primary target was El Puma. The operation lasted two and a half years and resulted in 30 arrests, 19 search warrants, and the seizure of millions of dollars in assets. The investigation took place in Dallas, San Antonio, McAllen, and Loretto and involved the collaboration of several police departments in Texas. Operation Puma was also backed by the Texas Department of Public Safety, the U.S. Marshals Service, and the Bureau of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Among the 30 arrests was Carlos Landin Martinez. In May of 2007, El Puma was indicted for drug trafficking, conspiracy, and money laundering. He wouldn't be arrested until three months later, on July 17, 2007. Leonardo Silva, a DEA agent, was browsing the aisles at an HEB supermarket in McAllen, Texas, when he spotted Carlos. He was accompanied by two men who presumably were his bodyguards. As one of the agents involved in the Gulf Cartel investigation, Silva quickly recognized Martinez's face. Knowing he was outnumbered and unable to make the arrest, he followed the men as they exited the grocery store and called for backup from the McAllen Police Department. Carlos was surprisingly unarmed and did not attempt to resist arrest. He also openly admitted to his identity and remained compliant with the police. Although there was not an issued arrest warrant for Martinez, Mexican authorities were quick to assure the DEA that they would be able to incarcerate him, should a U.S. judge not approve a warrant. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to catch a notorious drug lord like El Puma, and both countries knew that they had to act fast. On July 19, 2007, Martinez appeared in court for an initial hearing with Judge Peter E. Ormsby. At the hearing, DEA agent Jamie Fernandez presented evidence of four informants linking Martinez to drug seizures and smuggling through the Reynosa Corridor. Martinez's legal team was led by attorney Oscar Rodolfo Alvarez, whose defense was that he fled to the U.S. for fear of his life being taken should he remain in Mexico. Alvarez also stated that the arrest against Martinez was unlawful, as an arrest warrant was not issued prior to him being taken. The defense then asked the judge to consider Martinez's year of service in the Tamaulipas police force and that the case being built against him was primarily supported by criminals that he had helped to arrest during his time as a commander. The hearing resulted in Martinez being held without bond and under federal custody, as requested by the prosecution, and the possibility of immigration charges due to his indeterminable entry to the United States. He had been known to illegally cross the border to visit his family through routes in the Rio Grande River, so whether or not this time's entry was legal was unknown. Martinez's official trial was conducted on January 14, 2008, the turnout was larger than anticipated, with officers having to cordon off courthouse parking lots and security having to be increased tenfold. El Puma's name was not only feared but also well known, so it was no surprise that his trial was won for the headlines. All 30 of his attending family members had to be extensively screened by the police, and the Hidalgo County Sheriff's Office had their SWAT team on standby throughout the whole trial. Drastic security measures were taken, even to the point of housing Carlos in the United States Marshals Service facilities to ensure that he was under surveillance at all times. The jury for this case consisted of nine women and three men, and Martinez was accused of 10 counts of drug trafficking, conspiracy, and money laundering from his time in the narcotics scene from 2005 and 2007. As expected, he pleaded not guilty. New witnesses would give their statements for all seven days of the trial. Many of the witnesses in this trial were also heavily involved in the drug trafficking scene and were on the stand in hopes of reducing their own sentences. Whether they were criminals themselves or a member of the police department, they all connected Martinez to illicit activities correlated to his charges. The defense argued against the validity of these statements, questioning the direct linkage of their words, as well as bringing each witness's personal history to light. Smugglers were said to be untrustworthy sources due to their drug usage. Police officers were questioned on the extent of their relationship with Martinez. They attempted to poke holes in every witness's testimony. Aside from witness statements, the prosecution presented a multitude of evidence. Narcotics, wiretap phone conversations, and personal possessions were brought before the jury. The witnesses also continued to paint a dark picture of Martinez, doing tell-alls about the threats he would issue to their families, the fear he would instill in them, and the evil deeds he would conduct to build his empire. To the courts, the verdict was clear. On January 22, Carlos Landin Martinez was found guilty of all charges. The defense was sure there was insufficient evidence directly linking Martinez to the crimes, but they accepted their defeat. As the verdict was told to the court, there seemed to be emptiness in Martinez's eyes, and his face remained stone cold. 
His family members wept in response, some even going to media outlets to try and redeem his character. Carlos Landin Martinez was sentenced to life in prison on April 29, 2008, with charges of possession with intent to distribute, money laundering, cash smuggling, and involvement within a high-level criminal organization. Whether he was acting as a commander in the Tamaulipas police force or being the second in command of the Gulf Cartel, Carlos Landin Martinez's story is one for the ages. Although imprisoned, it's clear that his ability to double-cross has made a mark in the world of drug lords.